this is a sheep and feeder calf commodity meeting, NFO National Convention, Louisville, Kentucky, 1982. I'm the director of the sheep division, and um, I'd like to give you a little report on what's been happening uh, with the sheep division and those of you that are in the feeder cattle. I think there'll be a lot of similization here because of the fact that uh, uh, we share about uh, the same problems, uh, particularly in the uh, in the feeder uh, feeder lamb division uh, and the uh, uh, feeder cattle division. I'm here to talk about something that uh, uh, has really shown up to me this year. Uh, I've been working as a management consultant as well uh, to a packing plant in uh, New Mexico, and I'm going to deal with liquidation versus forward contracting. Now, liquidation, we have all know what that is, because uh, when somebody says he's going to have to liquidate, usually it's uh, somebody is selling him out. In this case, I'm referring to the sale barn situations or just calling me up the night before and saying, I have to sell a load of lambs that should have went yesterday. There's really no bargaining power in that for me. And if there's no bargaining power for me, there's none for you as well. Uh, liquidation is certainly not NFO's forte. We're long-term contractors. That's where I can do a job. And when I say that, I'm going to, uh, to give you some examples of that. But, uh, you know, the, uh, really liquidation is almost like rainy day marketing. You know, it's rain, so we can't work in the field or we can't do something, so let's go to town and sell some livestock. And uh, what does that do? also on the other side of the fence to the buyer because I'm also having to face the fact of, of trying to uh, have a stable, and that's a very important word, stable supply coming into a plant. Now I happen to be in charge of buying old ewes for export and we're as businessmen at a very disadvantage uh, a very big disadvantage because we're just businessmen and when we go into the market such as uh, Cuba, uh, Puerto Rico, Haitia, the Bahamas, places of that nature, we don't buck other businessmen. We have to go against governments. And I can remember very much this year that during the fall run when we have a whole bunch of these old hues that have to be gotten off the range so that uh, we don't waste uh, uh, the resources on the range feeding some uh, some you that undoubtedly will not make it through the winter. And I'm uh, like everyone else. We all have cash flow problems and we need to keep our bills paid. And when we put this uh, begin to put up uh, old U's into uh, these uh, shipping containers for export it takes anywhere from 30 to 60 days, and we, and we have our money tied up at that time. So we need sales. So we get on the phone, we call ahead, and we have to go against the New Zealand Australian people. And uh, not people, we go against their government because they're subsidized, we're not. So consequently, when we make a commitment, we have to live up to it. And in doing so, we need to know, are we going to have that supply to be able to back up our commitment? For example, right now, I have a commitment to go, and I haven't got the order filled for the simple reason that uh, uh, the U's have now dried up, they're not available, and uh, I'm beginning to wonder if I'm going to have to give a, some type of a uh, economic compensation to the buyer that I dealt with because I'm not getting a flow of use. Now, I, I know one thing. We've got a heck of a storm in the Rocky Mountain area right now, so I'm going to go back west with a pretty firm conviction that there'll be some use being liquidated because now we've got to feed them hay. But this is the kind of thinking that causes all kinds of problems down the line because I can't determine how to sell the product that we're going to get from you effectively when I really don't know when it's going to come. The point I'm trying to make is it is so important to the buyer as well as the farmer 
to know when you're going to come and to have some way to manage the supply that's coming to us so that in turn we are not in a in a distressed selling situation so in turn that we can say hey yes we've got we're going to have use we're going to be able to put you up a load of use on the 15th i'll have another one on the 20th i'll have another one on the 25th and right on down the line and that man can go to his customers who are willing to pay the price most generally if we do not buck uh, subsidized livestock that is an oversupply, let's say, from New Zealand or Australia. But these people will commit on forward contracts. In fact, they're dealing on forward contracts. They don't want to make a commitment unless they can come to me and say, when will you have a load of, of carcass mutton to go and how much do you want for it? That's as simple as the trade is. And if I say I'll have a load on the 25th and I want blank price, they said, we'll send you a confirmation for that, and we expect the product. And that's just, the, that's just how simple it is. Now, how does that relate to you folks in the country? Is that the way you do business? That, that has to be, then it has to come back to the people in the country. If that's not the way you're doing business, that's the way that the system, and that's the way the businessmen are doing business. Now, if your answer to this is, I said liquidation, we come to town, and we sell them when we have nothing else to do, or, my gosh, we're out of feed, or I don't want to buy any more hay, or, gee, many, we need something else to, uh, 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 for the farm tractor or something. We better sell some sheep and pay for that. Now, if that's your kind of a marketing plan, then you, the reason we've got deep trouble is because the rest of us that are trying to do business cannot do business on that basis. I walked through the door in coming uh, here, and a lady met me right on the spot. She said, where have you been? And I said, well, I've been working. She says, well, she said, you know that we sold 130,000 sheep through the Faith South Dakota auction barn this year. And I said, yes, I suspicioned you did, but I also know one reason, I also know this, that they went through that barn because that's what the growers wanted them to do. That's just that simple. Don't tell me how many sheep went through the auction barn because that's what the grower wanted them to do or they'd never be there. Two years ago, we went into that same area. The market was something around 60 cents. We raised the level to 70 cents, got about 10,000 lambs committed, and the buyer backed up when the market went down into the low 50s. NFO, through their reserve clause, went in, paid every member that was under that contract the exact price that we contracted for, suffered the loss, and resold the lambs at a considerably less money. Now, that's two years ago. Now, we lived up to our commitments, and yet we had 130,000 lambs that wanted to go through the auction barn. They knew where NFO was. We sent men out into the country. But basically, people, this is a self-help program. This is your program, and my bargaining power is about as equal to the, to the amount of product that I represent, and that just boils down to this. If I've got one sheep to sell, I've got one bargaining power or one unit of bargaining power. If I've got 10,000 sheep to sell, I've got 10,000 units of bargaining power, and if I have 100,000 sheep to sell, I have 100,000 units of bargaining power. That's just the way it works. Now, let's say that, that uh, we're talking about forward contracting. Now, the most simplest thing for me as a, as a representative of NFO is the daily deal. Uh, it just merely, here's a, a load of lambs right here from Monta Vista, Colorado. Uh, the telephone call was made to me two days ago. We have a load of lambs that we wish to move uh, next week. What happens? I make a telephone call. I, I obtain the best price possible. At that moment in time, we sell the lambs, and that's the, all there is to it. Now, forward contracting, see, I never am never, the reserve clause, uh, unless we have a bankruptcy or we have some unforeseen element developed, the reserve clause is, for NFO is never exposed on short-term contracts. And we must remember that it is not the importance of the volume of buyers now, this always seems to, 
to really be a catcher for, for most people. Oh, we had a lot of buyers at the sale. We had a lot of people show up. Or we had, or the telephone auction, we have 20 men on the telephone, but three are bidding. And I can't, let's, let's put you in a position of, let's say all of you have got a lot of land, something on feed, and you've got to have feed. You don't have the feed on the place, so you're buying it. You have to know where that feed's coming from and what it's going to cost you so, and when it's going to be there because you cannot let your livestock run out of feed. I have the same problem when you run a plant. I cannot allow the plant to run out of livestock. So that means when I go to an auction, I go to an auction with, with one thought in mind. I'm going to go to the auction and buy something if it's a bargain. I cannot afford to base my business on what I might or might not get in an auction. I can't get, I can't take the chance that somebody else might come there short as well as I'm short and we turn around and each one of us blow our brains out. Not only that is if there's only a certain amount of sheep there, uh, somebody's going to go home with the sheep and another guy's going to go home empty handed. Now you can't run a plant and you can't come back and tell your sheep or your cows or whatever you're feeding that oh I went to the auction today and the guy outbid me so you guys will have to go hungry tonight it's just that simple you can't do business that way that's why the forward contracting situation is is now developing to the point that buyers are looking for us I come here today with a floor and ceiling contract for lambs five months out in front We'll get paid for off-all credits, we'll get paid for pelt credits, and, we will ha and our market will be on, the, on a weekly basis based on, on, the going, on the going dressed market in New York, which is the, is the de determining market for sheep. So consequently, here's a buyer that's coming out to me and say, look, in fact, they went to the people I'm with today and said, could you let your, could we, could we definitely want to talk to, to, to Dick before he goes back east so that he can present our ideas that we would like to do so that NFO will know that there is a buyer out there that wants to commit himself forward for five months. I haven't got any five months commitments. I want one thing to be understood and understood clearly, and this will go for feeder cattle as well. There is no such thing as a long-term contract without a long-term commitment. It's just that simple. If we can't get it on inventory, and if we can't put it on a contract for sale, and if we can't get it to a negotiating table, then it is not for sale. There's no way that we can negotiate uh, a sale for, for, for a product or, or, or a production that we don't have. Now that goes for feeder cattle, goes for lambs, it goes for anything that we're going to sell grain. The whole, so, so in NFO, we share, a whole lots, uh, we share a whole lot of things in common in every department. That's why many times these particular conventions are so good for me because I get to come here and I get to see what the other departments are doing and I get to an education and I get a chance to come to uh, a chance to learn some some better techniques. Now, last year, show you how the program works in California. Uh, we have county people, not NFO headquarters people, not field staff that travel through the country, but county people that run the sheep program in their in their areas they come together there may be several counties together that elect a chairman and the best programs that the sheep division has today are run by the county people that's a fact and every time to give you an example we had a super guy in california and the people loved him. He did, a, he, he did a fantastic job for NFO, and he did everything for those people. It, he, if they went on vacation, he'd go turn the sheep out in the pasture. He was just that good. And people liked him. And I'm sure you're saying, gee, that's the kind of guy I'd like to have around. Unfortunately, he died. And with him, the program died because that was the mainstay, that was the spark plug, that was the guy that kept the whole thing together. 
But when I have a county organization that has depth in it, if one man's sick or another man's not there, and we have two or three fellows working in, 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 contract, in contact with each other and working in a tandem or in a team, one guy's gone, the other one picks up the slack, and there is no change in the quality of delivery or the administration of that particular delivery. So to me, folks, it goes down to the bottom line, and the bottom line is you. If you've got a good, strong uh, meat committee, you've got a good, strong a uh, group of people in your area that care about the program and want to see it work and you have your and you hold your meetings they hold their monthly meetings there isn't one month that goes by in those areas that they don't have at least a monthly meeting on sheep and that keeps those people up to date on what's going on but it also lets their leadership know that the fellows that are representing them in that county level know what their needs are it's just as simple I don't have to travel from, from Utah out to, uh, to California to find out what's going on. They take their inventory, they call me up, they hold, they tell me what the inventory is, I tell them market conditions, they hold a meeting and they come back to me with a price. And I go, f and then that's my job. Not organizing, not holding membership meetings, but bargaining for the pro production that they're putting up to me. Now this year, in a particular case, we used to have Oregon well organized in sheep. When the man died in California, he also covered that area. That area began to dry up and it just literally fell apart. Now that shouldn't bother too much in California, we wouldn't think, but this is a national organization. In California this year, we had the block put together. We had it priced at 65 cents. We got bid 61 and a half. And that was well within our tolerance area of what we talked about, floor and ceiling, and about 50 to 60 percent of that block elected to take 61 and a half, and we sold. The balance of the block, because this is the way we operate, deter uh, elected to hold for 63 cents. Now, while we were, I was still in the course of, uh, of, of negotiations trying to find another buyer that would pay as much mu or as much. And, and, and pay the 63 cents, the Oregon people elected to sell, and they sold at 50 cents. And right now, the balance of that block in California was go, went to the same buyer, went at 50 cents after 45 days of total frustration of trying to, to find new buyers, trying to, find, trying to beat the market that was established by Oregon. Now, had we had the Oregon people with us, that situation never would have happened. I don't say that I would have been able to salvage the whole Oregon situation, but it certainly would never have gone off at 50 cents because it was just a, 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 almost right out of left field. So those are the things that a, a, that a bargainer on a national level experiences. We have a considerable amount of problem. Again, it's all communications. I represented a set of lambs out of Monta Vista, Colorado. Got them sold at $52.50 to, the, uh, to, a, to a buyer that is in the plant that I, I'm a consultant to. Not over 10 minutes later, 35 miles down the road, a curbstone trader, a trader calls him up and sells him a load of lambs at 50 plus a quarter. Two and a half quarter cents difference had nothing to do with the market. It just had to do with who was selling the lambs and who was pricing them. And the curbstone trader didn't know what the market was, and neither did the guy that was selling them. But I'll tell you one thing, when I went back in the next week with some more lambs at 52 cents, I didn't get them sold. I had to hunt a new buyer. I got them sold, but I didn't get them sold to him because he found a place where he could buy them at 50. And do you blame him? You people don't run around the country when you're looking for hay or feed and figuring out how much money you can pay for it. When you're looking for hay or feed, you're looking for the best buy you can find. And if you find hay for $50 a ton, you're not going to pay, pay 60 And that's just the same any other buyer is. One of the things that gets us a lot of trouble, and I think this is particularly as well in feeder cattle as it is in lambs, is indicating bids. Oh, they can throw us for a loop. An indicating bid, would you take, when the market's around, looks like we ought to put a block of sheep, a, a sheep together at $0.60, cents, 
And a guy will come along and he said, I think maybe we could maybe get you 63 if you hold a little. Boy, that stops the music. And that puts that buyer who hasn't got a bid in a position to, to basically stop that block, stop that set of lambs from being moved, buys him some time. What's he got to lose? Nothing. He has nothing. He has, he has done nothing but indicate to you. He has told you that he might be able to get you 63. And naturally, you're, you're very anxious to get 63. So the block stops its movement. You begin to immobilize the block. And in doing so, he buys time enough to see whether it does go up to 63, which then would it could give him a chance to, to, to get the lambs bought, or they go down to 55, which is where he had his money in the first place. Now that's that in an indicating bid, we've got to deal in facts, folks. The money that goes on that check and the, uh, the price per pound that goes on your, your uh, accounting situation, that's what we get paid for. Those indicating bids are, are, are really trap plays, and we have to be very, very careful of them. I had a discussion with a fellow to show you how vulnerable we are, and this is a small lot of sheep. But I came in here, and, and he's a fellow that I've known for quite some time, and he came in, and he was telling me about his program, and he says, you know, I go to this sale, and this fellow comes out of Chicago, and he says, you know, every time I, I call him, and he's, when he calls me, lets me know he's coming up, and I take my lambs over to that sale barn, and he just gets in there, and he just, there's a local guy there that wants to buy some for his grocery store, and he said, he just gets right in there, and he just pumps them. I get six or eight cents over the market every time I get he just, just won't let that buyer have him. I says, that's wonderful. I said, say, how old is this fellow? Oh, he says, he's got to be in his 70s. I said, what are you going to do when he's gone? Now, it's just a little tiny situation here, but that's basically the way a lot of our marketing program is run. Just very short term. Whatever I can get this moment in time, let's, let's go on, you know, get it. Let's go and not con be concerned with a long-term situation. I'm concerned with long-term situations because that's the way the business in the United States is run. Whether we like it or not, people need to know the inventories that are going to be available, but they not only need the inventory to be available. Let's say this year they went out on this new situation and they got a lot of, a lot of lambs put together in Montana, but nothing under contract for sale as far as NFO is concerned. No firm commitment from the members. So what happened? Went out and spent each evening for a number of evenings getting the market. At that time, the market was around 42 cents, and we turned, and by the time we got through negotiating, we had a 46 cent market for them, but we had a stipulation if they weighed over 100 pounds, there would be a discount. Now, all of a sudden, the market has shown some strength because NFO has moved into that area. We've moved the level from 42 to 46 cents, which is way below cost of production. Don't misunderstand me. But I, this is no long-term contract deal either. I'm dealing uh, in, within a few days' delivery. But we've moved at 4 cents. What happens? The same buyer that bid them 42 cents walked in and said, I'll give you 46 cents, and those few head that are going to weigh 100 pounds, I'll just let them go. Now, the people got the price, fine. But the organization spent a lot of money, your money, getting that price and received nothing in return for it. Now, folks, there's no way that we can do that either. You folks can't. You're not running a charity institution here. This situation has to be a self-supporting operation in order for it to exist. And, and a negotiator like myself has to have the the amount of I income necessary to run his division. And if I can't, then the division does like everything else. It just falls apart and dissipates. You know, in a buyer's terminology, and we have to keep this in mind because this, some, this is just about the way they think of us many, many times. There's two commodities they can buy for a quarter. That's a cup of coffee and a farmer. And unfortunately, the coffee's gone up. It's a fact of life. It's not an insult. That's just the way they feel. And you people exist, for most people. It used to be that 
when you're working with speculator when you're working with speculators and people of this nature those people have got to come in and see what biggest slice of your pie they can get now when we go to long term forward contracting those people are not interested in your economics. They're interested in getting a, gaining a, a, a stable supply so that they can run their business. They aren't interested whether you're making money or you're not making money or how much money can they make on a margin basis from you. They're basically interested in securing a supply from you so that they, in turn, can go to their end of the business spectrum and run their own business and not run it on a, on a basis of an up-and-down, boom-or-bust type situation. Most businesses can't exist that way. The only ones that seem to be in business today that are doing that is, is us. And you know what kind of trouble we're in today. Now, block action is a serious threat to any local buyer. A block action is absolutely a disaster for a local buyer because most local buyers exist on the fringe areas and they exist on the basis of attempting to uh, gain some type of a margin in the up and down movement of a market. And block action prevents them from that because he wants to sit back, he wants to be as close to the time of delivery, he wants to have that animal resold before it ever gets, before he ever talks to you, he wants to know what his margin is. That's a good trader. He knows exactly. If he's going to bid you 51, he knows he's got 52 cents for that lamb and he knows he's got a dollar sewed into it. That's the way he operates. If he stays in business, that's the way he operates. We've got to make a decision. Are we going to run, are we going to use their system or are we going to use ours? Now, the old tactic for a long, long time, and they keep it going, and it's, it's to their advantage. Hitler used it. Divide and conquer. Divide and conquer. Keep you people completely confused. Compete, keep you people from collectively bargaining. Keep you from particularly block action or collective bargaining. The bottom line here is that we're in trouble. I don't care. That's one thing that farmers, I think that we, you know, you say farmers can't agree on anything. I would think today that a farmer would have to agree that agriculture is in trouble. I would think that we would come to that term today. And I think we have a decision to make. Do we use their system of ours? Who do you folks want to put your trust and confidence in? Now, I'm sure that not all of us uh, are, are exactly what you want, but we're sure a long ways down the road from what you've got. You have the only organization today that has any kind of a cadre, any kind of a crew put together that can effectively deal with collective, de collective bargaining in agriculture. You're the only people we may not be the most best-looking troops that you've ever seen, but we're the only troops in the field today. And when you go back to the country and you're talking to your neighbors, that fellow that's going to that that fellow that's going to come knocking on your door demanding his notes or his payments or whatever is going to knock on his door as well. We're not living in an isolated situation. Whatever is affecting you is affecting your neighbor. Whatever is infecting your neighbor is infecting you. You cannot sit on your farm and say, I can go it alone any longer because we're not only in a, you're not only in a national marketing situation, you're hearing international marketing. It is a different ball game and we've got to use different tools. And collective bargaining is one of the very best tools that has been put forth. And in fact, today it is the only tool in marketing today that will get a farmer anywhere close to the reality of what the true value of his product is. I'd say this one thing, and you guys are all farmers, it's either go, it's either grow or go. You've either got to produce a, a crop in the field in order to be able to pay your bills. Well, it's not good enough anymore because you've not only got to be able to prove to get, uh, to get a crop in the field, but you've also got to get a crop in the bank that's going to pay interest and going to pay overhead. 
So you've either got to, to, to make the necessary changes, and most of it basically is, in, in, is right here. It's in, our, in our, it's in our mind. It's in our attitude. You've got to reach down inside of you and say, do I really believe in collective bargaining? Do I accept the fact that that's the best way to go today? Tomorrow is something else, but today, what have I got? What's my alternative to collective bargaining today? And if I have no alternative, do I believe in the concept of collective bargaining? And then if you do, then you've got to go back and you've got not only to run your own situation and your own farms on collective bargaining system, but you've got to get every neighbor on both sides of you and up and down the road because they're all go you're all in the same boat. You cannot sit in your end of the rowboat with a hole in the other end and figure you're going to hit shore. There's no way. We've got a unique organization, I think, now, as we've come along, people are beginning to recognize how unique we are. We had a real difficult problem early on. There's no question about it. The NFO's biggest problem is they were before their time. You know, I'm getting old enough now that 100 years isn't all that far back. I'd hate to be trying to sell you folks televisions today 100 years ago. But it's just, it's a reality. It's an everyday situation. You see it, you accept it. Well, so is collective bargaining, and it's here, and it's times here. And you folks are the ones that are going to be the people that are going to make it work. What is an NFO bargainer? What is an NFO officer? We're merely people that coordinate the forces that are created by you people in the country. It's just that simple. If everybody brings one bucket of water here to this place here and poured it on the front poured it down the, in, out here in the lobby, we'd have a, a flood. One bucket of water isn't going to mean a whole bunch in that lobby, but I'll tell you one thing. If everybody walked in here, they talk about pollution. I often think about it. Thank God in one of those big football games that we aren't still riding horses in the parking lot. We'd have a hell of a time getting to the car. All I'm saying to you folks is that it, the bottom line is this, that the real power of NFO does not stand on this podium. It stands in the country. We are going to be, our bargaining power is going to be equal to the bargaining power that the, on the county level. The production that the county people put together will, will give us the bargaining force to be able to get prices that are going to give us cost of production plus a reasonable profit. And if we find no coordinated force in the country, then we as negotiators are going to have to deal fragmentary, in fragments. And that's exactly what big business doesn't want. For a long time, big business was afraid of us because they thought if we ever got the power, then all of a sudden they would be the weak people. Actually, we need to work in harness with big business. We, first of all, need to get a cost of production plus a reasonable profit. And do you know why they want us to, see, want us to get that? Because the worst thing that can happen to any business or to any people, let's say, that are laborers in a company is to have a company that is unprofitable because unprofitability will close the company and they will lose their jobs. And a fellow that needs farm products and needs farm production sure doesn't want to see farmers fail. So we've got to build in to this situation in our negotiations with the people that we're doing business and into the system a cost of production plus a reasonable profit for the American agriculture and for the American farmer. When we do that, then business can say, this is the way I'm going to price mine because I have to price it in relation to what I have to pay for it and what my production costs are. I thank you very kindly for your time. I want to spend just a, a few minutes this morning going over with you kind of the general outlook of the market at the current time. I guess we kind of started off here earlier in the summer with a general attitude that because of the moisture we'd had, and because there is a lot of feed in the country, 
that the feeder cattle prices definitely had to get better. And I know we had a lot of the industry that was pushing the same idea. I know in the western states when we were attempting to contract the feeders, we run into this and the fact that the dealers and the barns, which that's only a normal situation, were saying that cattle should not be contracted this year because they were sure they was going to see that 80, 90 and a dollar level again this fall. You see, the reason again that we've got to be nationwide and a total program is because there's two major reasons that what we had happen this year happened. Instead of it getting better, it got worse. Why? Number one, in spite of the feed that we had available, we got the kind of weather conditions through the Corn Belt that nobody was sure they was even going to get it out. Consequently, they weren't too anxious to jump on a set of calves. The number two situation was the drought throughout the wheat belt. I would say last year at this time we had moved approximately 40 to 50,000 head of calves into the Texas, Oklahoma, western Kansas area to go on wheat. This year the only thing that's happened there is several of those guys called and what few calves they had they wanted to go ahead and move them out of that area also. So you see you're faced with a, a doubly bad situation as far as what's going on. There's no cattle moving that direction and the weather conditions up here are not as such that anybody is really very interested in buying. So it didn't do what everybody thought. So that's the reason that in the summer and in the spring we attempt to get out and start a forward contracting program that will work. I want to spend just a few minutes now going through some overlays with you, showing you what has happened in 1981 and 1982 and what caused it. Would you hit the light switches back there, Dick? And Okay, in, uh, <clears throat> in 19, excuse me, in 1981, which is your crooked line, and this will run true year after year. I have some people tell me that this is coincidence that things like this happen. But as you see your crooked line in the spring, the NFO members started to block feeder cattle and the market immediately starts to react. I can tell you right now, a sale isn't even necessary, we've discovered in this organization, to make the market react to what's happening. It really isn't. But we started to move the market up, and very, very early in the year last year, the buyers again, or the sellers again, decided that the feeder cattle market was going to go wild and you couldn't get anything sold on forward contract. The majority of our sales last year was made from October 1 on. That's not forward contract. That's what Dick was talking about a while ago. You know, it is an advantage if we know even a week or two ahead of time that you want to move production but it's so much more of advantage if you've got time to work on them and time to set the buyers up to buy your blocks. So what happened the minute we become uncontractable? Then it's a chase to see how many you can get sold before the market gets any lower. And by doing that, we ourselves are also helping to drive the market down instead of to stabilize and set a market. 
In 1982, we had a little bit different situation than we did in 1981. The membership throughout the country started blocking calves again in the spring and again started raising the market level. You can see there about March, we pretty well had the calves blocked as far as we were concerned in the country. And for about a month, we went through a period there with nothing happening whatsoever. We had a little increase in the market, but very little. The 1st of April, we started sending teams of guys into the country who had been trained to go out and get the product. We had several things happen that surprised all of us. Number one, we discovered that 98% of the people that we visited with were willing to give us an inventory to work with. That was probably the most surprising thing that we found out. Many, many of these were non-members or non-participating members and they were willing to put their production onto the blocks. So as this team started to work in the country, within a period of about three weeks when we worked about four different areas blocking calves, the cattle market raised approximately five bucks a hundred. Now this graph you're looking at if the prices don't seem quite right, that is a national average, and that is a combination steer and heifer price. But that does show you how it moves up and down. Okay, on May 1 or thereabouts, we pulled our teams back in out of the country. We had some pretty sizable blocks of cattle. So we went out of the country and the moment we become non-active in these areas, you see what happens. There was nothing going on. There was nobody forcing any other buyers to be out on the road doing anything. So we immediately start a downward slide. We were not being able to get really anyone interested in buying calves at that particular time. But about the 1st of July, we started getting a little interest and we sold several blocks of calves in the Missouri area. We also sold about six loads of cattle out of Montana. We had several collection points put together, one load at each point so that nobody really ended up taking the blunt if we did successfully raise the market level. So we sold those and immediately we started getting a reaction on the market. And within the next 30 days, and we started selling some larger blocks and more cattle in Missouri and more cattle in South Dakota and more cattle in Montana, we raised the market level $7 within the next 30-day period of time. Now what it amounted to was the first sale was like 67.50 for calves 550 and up. 